the William Thompson Recreation Centre in Burnley. Looking at it from Grimshaw Street, we are reminded of the scene in August 1971, when here was a car park. But the story begins five years before that, for it was on the 25th of February 1966 that the Burnley Express announced a gift of £350,000 to the town of Burnley by this man, William Thompson. William Thompson comes of a long line of public-spirited men. In Burnley Town Hall is a list of mayors of the town and in 1875 to 1877 already we find another William Thompson as mayor of Burnley. This was our William Thompson's grandfather. It was his uncle James Whittam Thompson whose generous bequest made this splendid park available to Burnley people. In 1966, when he made the gift, William Thompson was 72 and lived in this modest house in Todmorden Road, Burnley. Between the announcement in 1966 and the start of the building, five years were to elapse. Fred Stasica, Deputy Borough Architect, had to draw up plans and perspectives in a form which lay members of the council could understand. For the cost not covered by the gift was to be met from the rates. In the drawing office, these were converted into working drawings. At last, in September 1971, the tenders were received and opened by Mr. Stasica and Alderman Thomas Holgate, Chairman of the Recreational Facilities Committee. The successful tender was made by Sir Alfred McAlpine and Sons Limited. In all, the estimated expenditure came to 968000 four hundred and ninety six pounds so back to august 1971 and the car park in the center of burnley the end of october 1971 the leaves are turning and the car park is still fully used. But a notice makes the future plans quite clear and causes a certain amount of annoyance as reported in the local press. The contract starts on the 1st of November 1971 although for a time a single compressor and two or three workmen are the only sign of activity. A few cars even managed to sneak onto the site. But eventually, the posts and the parking signs are removed and the top end of Grimshaw Street is closed. The closure causes more annoyance, mainly to motorists who miss seeing the no-entry sign.
By December, work has started in earnest. The contractors' huts have been built. A high fence has been erected to keep out intruders, photographers and so on. And machinery of great complexity appears. The site itself is of very doubtful origin, having been previously occupied by houses, some with cellars. Mining subsidence is always a potential problem in Burnley. So, it is necessary to stabilise the ground by a process known as vibroflotation. The machine used for this purpose bears a close resemblance to a spacecraft, especially when in action. Its function is to force vast quantities of gravel into the earth. To do this, it simultaneously drills a hole and washes down the gravel under high hydraulic pressure. This process is repeated over 700 times. So, a solid bed for the foundations is formed using 1,000 tonnes of gravel. For a period of six weeks, the contractors use 10,000 gallons of water a day. Not surprisingly, this leaves the site very wet. However, by the end of February 1972, the drain pipes have arrived. Altogether, over half a mile of pipes are used to drain the site. Other sanitary aware arrives too. Work proceeds on the foundations, which are of concrete, reinforced with steel mats. And, by the end of March, from the concrete blocks we saw earlier, a vast forest of steel has grown. Most of the girders used in the steel frame have a concrete poultice round them. This would prevent their distorting in the event of fire, and in the pool area offers protection against the chlorine in the air. Concrete is mixed in the usual way, and is poured into a skip, watched by McAlpine's works manager, Jim Hamlet. The skip transfers the mix to the frames in which the beam is to be precast. This precasting saves much time as to cast the concrete when the beams are in place would involve shuttering each one separately. Up above, work continues. David Shaw, the engineer, checks the accuracy of the pillars. There are 110 of these vertical members, each of which has to be set to an accuracy of 3 millimetres. As each one is found correct, it is finally bolted into position. Inside the shell, excavations are taking place. The hole which this machine is digging will eventually become the main swimming pool. Meanwhile, one of our friends above decides to descend the quick way. The following day, a large crane arrives on site. This is to hoist into position the cladding panels, 
384 in number, which form the skin of the building. August 1972. The roof is almost complete, but work has stopped because of a builder's strike, which is to last six weeks. From roof level, we see the position of the future pool. Looked at from ground level, the 384 cladding panels are in place and the building begins to assume a finished shape. Eventually, work is resumed and on the 20th of October 1972, the foundation stone is laid. The tackle is duly checked and Alderman Holgate introduces Walter Winterbottom, director of the Sports Council, who is to lay the stone, assisted by his worship the mayor, Councillor Abel Bridge. Mr. Winterbottom declares the stone well and truly laid, watched by C.V. Thornley, John Mattox and John Hartley, Ted Ashby, Fred Stasica and others involved in the project. By mid-February 1973, the boilers are installed. These have the task of all the space heating and also warming the water in the pools. The main pool is now ready for tiling. And by the end of April 1973, Almost all the 55,000 tiles are in place. One wonders where all the empty boxes went eventually. Outside the glazing of the staircases is taking place. Still in April 1973, and we begin to get an impression of the elevation to Centenary Way. To keep the air fresh and warm in a building of this size is no mean operation, and now the galvanized ducting is being hauled to the higher level. We are now in June 1973, and the three filter tanks are being installed. Each of these is capable in one hour of filtering 18,000 gallons of water. Outside, the sunbathers are in evidence. The roof is complete. And the work is discussed by Fred Stasica and Cyril Woods, the clerk of works. As one approaches the centre from the north, a mural catches the eye. Cast in a polystyrene mould, it is a tedious job to uncover the 32 panels which comprise it. The panels represent some of the sports for which the centre caters. The mural is the work of Charles Anderson. By April 1974, the tidying up begins. Grass is laid. The illuminated signs are waiting for the scaffolding to be erected. And preparations are being made for the first public inspection. As we look at the elevation to Centenary Way, we notice that one place of recreation, 
the Odeon cinema, which we saw at the beginning of our film, has given way to another, our new centre. Tony Carroll, the recreation centre organiser, inspects the water in the main pool, 130,000 gallons of it, and discusses its chlorination with John Hartley, now the assistant borough recreation officer. But before the centre comes into use, it is already being extended. Foundations are being laid for a high diving pool, not provided originally for financial reasons. And so, on the 22nd of April 1974, the Thompson Centre opens to the public. The official opening is delayed until the 29th of August, when Mr. Thompson's sister, Sarah Whittam Thompson, and the Mayor of Burnley, Councillor Edward Hanson, perform the opening ceremony in one of the centre's sports halls. Chairman for the occasion is Councillor Hayes, Chairman of the Recreational Facilities Committee. The event is tinged with sadness, for only days before it, William Thompson died. During the ceremony, the assembly rise for a moment's silence in his memory. Councillor Hayes now introduces the mayor and Miss Thompson, and the mayor refers to the facilities in the centre and on behalf of himself and Miss Thompson, declares it officially open. The speech is over, the mayoral party proceed to the entrance hall. Here, watched by the mayoress, the mayor and Miss Thompson unveil the commemorative stone and pose for a press photograph. William Thompson leaves behind a memorial which will give pleasure to generations of Burnley folk, the William Thompson Recreation Centre. The centre has a 33 metre swimming pool, and a learner pool is also provided. such sports as five-a-side football, and badminton. Table tennis is catered for and there are six squash courts. And for those who just want to keep fit, a fitness room. There's even a crèche in which children are looked after whilst their parents enjoy the other attractions of the centre. What better way to end our film than by showing the future sportsmen and sportswomen of Burnley? A film paying tribute to a man who loved to give, William Thompson. William Thompson, whose generosity Burnley people will always remember.